Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Barry Stewart, and the person behind the camera is Sandra Stewart, who you might guess is my wife. And we've lived at this address here for, since 1996, which was the year we were married. Is that right? Is that right, Sandra? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we, we're keen on wildlife. We garden for wildlife. Before we get started, I just wanted to put uh, where we live in context. So we live in Gosainen, which is Sandra's place of birth. And uh, Gosainen is on the, sort of the, the northwestern limit of Swansea's sort of urban conurbation. It's, a, it's a, a town with a population of around about eight and a half thousand people. And it's basically sort of conjoined with other neighboring towns like Lecha and Garden Village. Uh, and it's, it's a town which really grew on, the, um, on coal and tin plate works so it's got a very industrial heritage uh, but obviously those industries have long gone i apologize for the noise by the way we do live on a, a busy-ish road um, but as i say since we've lived in gosinan we live in a, in a very urban stroke suburban situation um, so there's no extensive areas of woodland around us the nearest habitat or semi-natural habitats um, are open pastures improved pastures uh, either sheep and cattle graves uh, areas with sort of reasonable hedgerows, but it's it's all fairly unremarkable land. Uh, we do have the Lucker Estuary, however, which is less than a kilometre away. Uh, that's a that's a special area of conservation. It's a it's a it's a SAT, so it's a European protected site. So we do occasionally see uh, and hear wildlife from the estuary. So when you go out at night, you can sometimes hear oyster catchers flying over. Um, or get moths in the moth trap which come off the salt marsh so uh, you might get the wind on this microphone there. so uh, anyway so that's a, just a little bit of contextual um, uh, for you before we get started the name Gorsinan by the way uh, means Einan's marsh Gors is marsh and Einan is the 11th century Welsh, Welsh prince after so many places were named after him um, and the other thing is the street we live on is called Penkai Crun which means uh, head of the round field. So there's not much legacy of any fields these days. Um, there was a, a chapel just down the road from us called Brintig Chapel, uh, which did have some uh, remnant grassland, but that's been redeveloped just this last year. The, the front lawn of the chapel had things like meadow thistle, um, uh, wolf caraway, and all sorts of other nice plants in there. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about wildlife generally, I'm going to focus on plants, uh, mainly because I've talked to you about moths before. And uh, so we're going to take a little tour of the garden, starting at the front, working up the side and ending up at the top of the garden. So it's like three phases. Um, we've got quite a long garden, it's 70 metres long. And the top end really has been converted into a little bit of a, um, uh, a little bit of a sort of a workshop for our horticultural practices. A year and a half ago, we set up a, a company called Celtic Wildflowers, and we grow wildflowers for conservation projects. So I'm afraid you'll see pots dotted around all over the place. But anyway, if we just turn to the first bit of vegetation in front of us, this was a rockery I built not long after we got here. Um, so all these, I'm going to take the camera off Sandra now. Hold that. All these bits of um, rock here are actually. Um, these are actually bits of lumps of quartz, which have obviously got algae and lichens and all sorts of uh, interesting things growing on them. But essentially, I put down a, a layer of polythene, covered it with gravel, punctured a few holes in so it drained and allowed plants to get roots. Uh, and things like the wild, uh, sorry, the thyme in front of you here, it's actually an ornamental thyme. Uh, this has been established now for well over sort of 15 years. Uh, and it's got various sedums growing into the monk, in amongst it. Now, when the thyme does come into flower, it is spectacularly attractive to invertebrates. Um, so the bees absolutely go crazy for it. And it's the same with the sedums as well. Um, so I say this is uh, the sedum which is coming up in, in this area here. This is uh, sedum, uh, sedum album, the white stone crop. Uh, and this although it is considered a bit invasive on the Gower Cliffs, it's quite a nice plant for the garden. It's probably the most easiest plant to propagate because you can just pull bits off, stick them on the ground, you don't even need to plant them. They seem to grow and you put them on gravel. So um, 
Uh, other plants you can see here, um, I'm sure one or two might recognize this tall leggy thing here. This is a uh, this is Deptford Pink, which is a bit of a, a neat petal, but I'll try and get that to focus. No, perhaps the, uh, sorry, the uh, camera doesn't seem to be, oh, there we are. Is that any better? Sorry, that's not zooming in very well at all. Anyway, so Deptford Pink is a, it's a, it's a nationally scarce species it is sort of formally protected uh, seeds were collected a few years ago to um by neath patalbert uh, council partnership or so the neath uh, patalbert partnership and um the, the plant has basically been reintroduced to a few different sites uh, although it's it's key site the Bag uh, bagland triangular pond it's having a bit of a bumper year this year so the the plant is in pretty secure hands however we've got a backup population if everything were to go wrong i think a few people probably have it in their garden um and it's it certainly does very well in a garden situation where you've got sort of gravel substrate um but obviously it's not just all about wild plants and gardens i'm not a purist i will basically plant anything if i think it's good and and i think wildlife will benefit from it or even if i just think it looks pretty so um there's a couple of things here which probably of interest um so this is kidney vetch which we introduced to our garden a few years ago and it's it does self-seed fairly readily although obviously we've grown it in in abundance at the moment for commercial reasons uh but it, it is it is super attractive to bees unfortunately it's a bit cloudy and breezy today so the bees seem to be having a bit of a day off a bit after all the hard work they've been doing in this lovely sunny weather um <clears throat> now every gardener has their pet hit weed and the one which always irritates me the most is this yellow thing over here so this is trailing tormentil uh potentilla anglica and it uh it really is persistent in this bed i just no matter how much i weed it it's got these long tendrils uh which always come back to this one of these sort of deep tap roots and no matter how much i grub, get my fingers in and grub it out it all seems to snap off and leave a little bit in the ground and it just comes back and sends shoots everywhere any keen botanists amongst you might notice this unusual foliage as belonging to mountain avens, dry as octopetala, which is a, an upland calcico plant. And this plant was given to me by a, a Gower farmer uh, called Ted Solomon, who was uh, passed away a few years ago now. And uh, I said Ted was a very keen gardener and he had the most amazing patch of mountain avens growing in his garden. So he gave me a plant and again we've probably had this for over 15 years now and it's uh it just keeps on spreading in fact i pulled up several square meters of it this year because it was taken over the bed but that's mount and it's got quite nice underside to the foliage there lovely glaucousy underside to the leaves um anyway and i'm just going to point at one other weed i do like weeds i think weeds are fantastic in the environment and i don't like to eradicate weeds from the garden at all because they do actually provide wildlife with lots of opportunities for seeds and flowers and pollination and they just add to the general diversity so my first sort of gardening tip is really don't get hung up about weeds even if you do have your your sort of uh, irritating species like this nasty thing here which is actually a really nice plant this um trailing tormentil uh, just if you've got sort of quiet corners you don't mind leaving a bit wild uh, let them go but this other thing in here this is uh this is one of the species which has gone a bit crazy in recent years. This is, uh, oh, I forget the common name now. Um, no, it's closely related to lamb's lettuce. It's um, one of the corn salads. It'll come back to me eventually. But um, Valerianella carinata is the scientific name. And it, it just self sees absolutely everywhere. It does seem to be a good food for polyphagous uh, caterpillars that is species of caterpillar that um that feed on a wide variety of foods so uh, so it does have its use and there's a little patch still in flower here so so these are the these are the flowers of valerianella, valerianella carinata um so i'm just going to come over here this is the fruit of the uh of the mountain avens the, the seeds rather a bit like um traveler's joy in some respects with those lovely uh wind assisted seeds just come past there it's probably a hybrid saxifrage 
Now this plant over here, this is another one of Neath Patalbert's speciality plants. This is um, an archaeophyte plant, i.e. a plant which has been in Britain for a very long time. I always forget the year. What's the year, Sam? 1492. There's a few botanical terms worth getting to know, one of which is archaeophyte, or two of which rather, arche archaeophyte and neophyte. So an archaeophyte is a plant that's been in Britain since 1492, which is about 500 years ago. Sorry? Before, sorry, before 1492. Uh, so obviously been here for a very long time, but probably introduced by man uh, in, in days gone by. And plants which have been introduced into the countryside since that date are called neophytes. So if you think of archaeophytes and neophytes, um, basically the neophytes are the ones we do get a bit concerned about when they start taking over the landscape. So things like Japanese knotweed, Himalayan balsam, they're all, they're all modern introductions to the British flora. Uh, and of course the other term, which uh, you're probably more familiar with is, is native plants. So as I say, in this bed, we've got a real mixture of neophytes, archaeophytes, and native species. But I'm just gonna go back to this one, sorry. This is, uh, this is called Hoary Mullein. Uh, and this actually grows near to the Amazon site. There's a population there. But there are very, very few other sites in the whole of Wales for this plant. So how, I mean, it probably is a very, very rare species. So what was that? Keeled corn salad. Thank you, whoever. Yeah. Charles. Ah, well done, Charles. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we've got a couple of plants here. We've got one growing in between two clumps of heather. Um, and they are very distinct, uh, very distinctive. So the mullein plants, you you will have all seen them, whether you're botanists or not. You often see a big rosette of, of like sort of very, very hoary leaves. Uh, and then you'll see a tall spike emerging in the summer, uh, which is covered in these uh, yellow flowers. Now the, the common uh, great mullein is the one you've probably seen. This hoary one, it's, got, it's actually got a finer sort of felt to it. It's, they, they're, they're relatively sort of similar looking species, but this particular one, the hoary one, is very, very rare. And as I say, Neath Patalbot is, a, is, is probably the key site for it in, in the whole of Wales. Uh, but it's, it's rare even in British terms as well. So we've got a few other bits and pieces there, which are, I'll skip over. I'm just gonna pop across to this other bed here. Now, I, we put this one in, so I'm gonna zoom out a bit now, there we are. We put, yeah, yeah, so Sam's just gonna go back now. So we, we put this bed in, I can't because you won't hear me. We put this bed in just a couple of months ago and uh, we've planted, they're actually growing. So one of the species you can see from here, this is Devil's Bit Scabious. As you can see, there's a bit more depth of pink there, but you've got Devil's Bit Scabious. Now a lot of these things aren't flowering yet, uh, but I'll, I'll just sort of whiz through some of the species. There's a different mullein there. This is Twiggy, Twiggy mullein, which is starting to put a flower spike on. There's another hoary mullein. And I'm just going to skip a little bit. Oh, there's some, uh, this is another Neath Patalbert seed collection job. So as, when I'm talking about these plants being collected from Neath Patalbert, these are collected as seeds. So this plant here is, um, oh, God, I was getting mixed up. Wild clary. I always say meadow clary, and I actually mean wild clary, which is just coming into flower at the moment. Again, I'll try and fig figure out the focusing on this shortly. But, uh, but yeah, that's, a, again, quite a rare plant. There's some lovely native populations on the Gower coast, uh, but it does turn up as a, as a sort of casual around dock sides in, in Neath the Talbot as well. So, um, so yeah, so we've got some English stone crop here. So this is a species you'd normally find on sort of acidic sites. Um, we've got some bloody cranesville, which actually is, is in flower now. That's just come into flower recently. Again, so these, these are, so basically you've got species which are, normally grow in acidic conditions, growing alongside species which you find in very calcareous conditions. And some grit knapweed here again, which is another calcicol, i.e. a species which likes calcareous ground, as opposed to the calcifuge, which, uh, which doesn't like growing in calcareous ground. Um, and one of the beauties of gardens, of course, is all of those characteristics of plants which restrict them to certain habitats and conditions just is thrown out the window you can basically grow anything alongside anything. So in the same bed here, we've got some 
uh, sea wormwood. This is a beautifully, if you want to do it, if you ever want to grow a sensory plant, this is the one to do. It's got the most, well, I wouldn't say a pleasant smell. It's got an incredible smell. And uh, it's, it, is a, it is a lovely plant, but that one is restricted to salt marshes. Uh, and as I say, you can grow all these plants alongside each other. And what we try and do in our garden is just try and provide a succession of flowers for bees, but also not just provide for pollinators, but also to provide for the larval stages of, of uh, invertebrates as well. So that some species might just feed on the leaves of a particular plant, uh, and, and therefore we'll sort of, we'll, we'll keep planting those as well. So Sandra's pointing me in the direction of this thing here, yeah? Uh, so I was just pointing at the earth, sorry. Yeah, so this is a thing, a non-native species called lamb's ears. And the reason we plant that in the garden, because there's a bee which absolutely goes crazy for it, called the wool card bee. And it actually collects the hairs off the leaves. It's got incredibly hairy leaves. As you can see. It's the hairs off the leaves to, uh, to make its nests. Uh, and uh, in fact, I saw first wool card bees uh, the other day in the garden, so, so they're already here. So other species, Charles will probably recognise this one. Uh, I've forgotten the value now. Charles, you have to you have come up with the answer again, sorry. But yeah, what, what one of the, uh, the cry, I think it was in the Crinant uh, area. Um, you've got um, Potentilla Sangus over there. Um, I'm trying to the common name again. Oh, yes. So, anyway, I think it's probably enough there. You get the idea. Just plant lots of nice species. They don't all have to be native species. Uh, yeah, oh, yes. Strawberry clover here doing well. Again, this is a salt marsh species, which is starting to spread out. This is a, this is a lovely thing. Um, and the other thing we've tried is, is hanging baskets. So here you've got some uh, kidney vetch growing in hanging baskets, which uh, just gives an extra little feature to the garden. So we've got to, I'll just step back a little bit. So you can see uh, a couple of hanging baskets there with kidney vetch doing nicely. I should have pointed out the kidney vetch we've got growing on the windowsill as well in the window boxes. It is starting to go over a bit now, but um, that has just been producing so many flowers um, over, the, over the last sort of month and a half, really. And uh, obviously that is very, very good for, for bees, but it, it also, it's got, uh, it's very good for uh, invertebrates that feed on the foliage as well. And one particular species, the small blue, which we don't get in our garden, uh, likes that. I'm just going to drop down a couple of pots. This is, a, this is a great plant to introduce to your garden if you've got walls. This is one of the campanulas. It's called Campanula uh, Poshkarskayana. I probably pronounced that wrong. It's a bit of a long-winded name. There are two species of Campanula, which are bell flowers, which look superficially uh, the same. Uh, but this Campanula Posh, Poshkarskayana is, um, is got a much more open flower. So the petals are uh, divided much more closer to the base of the plant. It's got bigger flowers and bigger leaves. Uh, the foliage is quite pretty as well. Uh, I'm not sure about its wildlife value, but it's uh, it's certainly an attractive addition to, the, to garden walls, and uh, it's it obviously provides lots of niches for invertebrates, and obviously so, some invertebrates will will get pollen, pollen and nectar from it. So I'm sure it does have uh, benefits. The other one, which looks similar, by the way, it's got an equally unpronounceable name. It's called Campanula portenschlagiana, and that one is let's say it's got smaller, rounder leaves, which are a bit more sort of spiky looking, and the the flower looks a bit more bluebell shaped than that one. So ones for you to look out when you, next time you're walking the dog down the street, you, you guarantee you'll see some on the street somewhere. So anyway, we're coming onto, onto the, the first of our little lawn areas. We, we, put, we set this bit of lawn aside for no more mare. Uh, I have done uh, sort of this a few times where we've just let this lawn go. Um, so as you can see, it's got quite a few flowers on it. Uh, the main species you can see is cat's ear, um, which this lovely, composite flower. Uh, it's got branch stems, one of the features, and the, the foliage is quite distinctive. Sort of ro rosettes of uh, leaves with lots of lobes on the side. Um, so it's yeah, Hypercaris radicata, it's a scientific, scientific name. And then you've also got a hyracium in there, fox and cubs, I just going amongst it. Oh, Sandra spotted a little insect in there. Okay, it's uh, gone to sleep in there. So yeah, you've got fox and club, uh, fox and cubs here, which is the uh, 
uh, a non-native species which does turn up. If you've got graveyards and cemeteries, you often see a lot of it. So there's, there's a little trifolium here, a little, um, oh, sorry, I'm terrible at remembering the common name, lesser trefoil. Some of the southern marsh orchids. It's probably one of our commonest orchids in the area. The six popped up on this little bit of lawn. And we don't do anything with this lawn other than just mow it and cut it. Uh, so it removes the cuttings every year. There used to be a big pampas grass in the middle here, which we took out. And that's taken a long time to recover. There's still a lot of weeds in there. So, uh, and the other thing which we did plant in here, the one thing we did plant was devil's bit scabious. To, just to see how it grows in an ordinary lawn. So these are plants of Devil's Biscabius, which were planted two years ago. And if you compare these with the ones which are planted in bare soil over here, you can see the ones that are planted in the bare soil where they don't have any competition with the roots, they've done spectacularly well. So, um, so that's Devil's Biscabius. All right, so anyway, we're gonna go through through the side gate now. The first batch of pots. These are juniper cuttings um, taken from Gower, obviously with permission uh, from the National Trust, uh, for whom we're a, a tree planting project. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of work being done to try and uh, get more native trees back on the garret in sort of appropriate situations, of course. Um, so yeah, junipers are doing well. Um, so I'm just gonna move quickly over here, Sam. So we've got little beds all around the place with native things. So, so this is just common knapweed, which again, has gone a bit crazy. It's not flowering yet. The small scabious has just started to flower. So this is probably our most important flower for, for bees. Um, this is a native species to the Gower Cliffs. So we've lost connection there temporarily. So we've, we've now moved through, there's, there's the house. We've moved through from the house. You can see our water butt. So we do harvest water, make good use of that. Another little rockery area. Now, I didn't go around buying limestone, chunks of limestone, but Sandra's uncle who lived up in Ammonford, uh, he was moving house and he had a whole load of um, these lovely sort of weathered limestone rocks. So rather than let them go, I, I did nick them. But uh, obviously it's not something you really want to be buying in the shop these days. Um, and, and yeah, they do. This is a sort of basic view from when I'm doing the dishes. Uh, this, is, this is the view I get. So I look up the garden and we've got a nice sort of mix of, of native and non-native plants. Now the, the ones you can see over here, in fact, this, this one is one of my favorites this year. So this is, uh, yeah, this is, so I'm just trying to think of it. It's, it's got various names, but it's, uh, I think it's called C Sicilian honey garlic. And it gives off the most amazing fragrant uh, sort of smell, that, like, which smells like honey. And the bees do go crazy for it. And once it finishes, obviously the flowers are pendulous, but it's, once it's uh, finished flowering, the seeds go erect. So it's quite bizarre, really, the seeds all stand tall. So you can see this one over here. This one is now finished flowering. Um, and this one's half, well, just about near the end as well. But that is a spectacular plant for, for bees and definitely one I would recommend for anyone who wants to uh, keep pollinators well fed because you can literally see the, the nectar oozing out of it. This is a, another Campanula, again, an ornamental one. This is um, Campanula persicifolia. Um, I think it's called um, peach, peach leaved bellflower. Uh, now there is a there's an interesting if you're into rusts, there's quite an interesting rust growing on the foliage there, which I did put on the Glamorgan Fungus Group webpage, and uh, it was identified by Nigel Stringer, and I, th I think he said it was a, a new host species for that particular rust. I'm not sure how common rusts are on Campanulas, but you can see there's a good level of infection in there now. Um, so that's, as I said, uh, Campanula, which again does attract bees in nice weather. We've got a nice sort of a cluster of foxgloves this year. They've done pretty well. So um, 
again, a real favorite with the, with the bumblebees. And if I just turn the phone down, you can see green plants, essentially. There's a lot of moss in there, um, which is mostly um, a common and widespread species you find in wetland situations. But the, there's a few other nice things in there, like royal fern, uh, there's um, cross-leaved heath, this little ericaceous plant. And then you've also got some marsh sanctifoil with the purple flowers. Uh, and the other thing you see lots of is, uh, is bird's foot trefoil. And this is a very common species throughout the county in a range of different habitats. And it's, it's a super important plant for, because, not just because it produces lots of pollen and nectar, but also because it's a good horse species for caterpillars of a wide range of species. Um, so if you do get a chance to encourage birds with trefoil into your lawn, whether you sow seeds or whatever, it is, it is a very, very sort of beneficial plant uh, wherever you see it, really. Um, and it's, once you've got it, it's, it's quite difficult to get rid of, really. I went, I went to the doctor's surgery yesterday and there's a bit of heavily mown lawn there and it was just covered in birds with trefoil. So um, is there some reason it's gone on the super wide angle? Anyway, so this is our first attempt at growing a, a tree mallow, which is another native species you find around coastlines. And it's, these things can go up to about two meters tall. And this one here, it started flowering. All the flowers seem to be sort of hidden beneath the leaves at the moment. Really beautiful flowers. And the bees do like it a lot. They go for it all the time. But if you look on the top, there's masses more flowers to come. And uh, hopefully, so sort of these spikes will just come up, get taller and taller. and will be taller than me by the end of the growing season um but it's it's a it's a lovely plant isn't it more more dianthus or myria the depth of pink there's a bit of a uh, bit more hoary mullein here again so I, I try not to put all my eggs in one, in one basket and there's a plant here i was given by viv lewis and viv and tony the late tony lewis very very uh, avid botanist around gower and he found this plant not too far from here actually in Gosinen. This is, um, this is a plant called hoary sankfoil. The underside of the leaves are very, very white. And it's actually a very, very rare plant. I think there are two known sites in, in, in Glamorgan. Um, one of them is in East Patalbert um, by the, the harbour wall, which was seen by Steph Tyler a few years ago. And then this one from Tony and Viv Lewis. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if that produces much seed. So one of the things we're trying to do is collect seed of not just sort of rare species but common species that are good for for pollinators this is pond number two it was quite interesting to listen to uh, mark barber and rose rivera last night listen to their uh, amphibian talk because they were saying um, frogs have a really tough time with uh, with newts basically the newts eat the tadpoles and the eggs uh, and so one of the solutions is to have multiple ponds so um so we've actually got three little ponds in this area. This is our main pond. This is about, this is about 12, 12 year old now. And every year we get dozens and dozens of frogs uh, laying eggs in here. Uh, but we never ever see a tadpole come out of it because there are so many newts. I'm just going to see if I can find a newt now. About to fail. There's going to be something in here. Lots of gunky mud. Yeah. Try again. What's that? It's not the best way to go pond dipping, really, with a, a sieve. But uh, <laughs> try. Yeah, try once more. Whoa. A bit of algae in there. A bit. Oh, there's something. Oh, yeah, a newt. There we are. So this is a palmate newt. Um, it's the only species we've ever seen in the pond. We don't have common newts in here, or smooth newts as they're sometimes called. You can see this one's still got his pointy tip to his tail. Um, and you, you can sort of tell, tell them by the unspotted throats as well. So that's a palmate newt. And these, like I said, these, if you have a lot of palmate newts in your pond, it will adversely affect the population of frogs you have. So one of the solutions, Mark, suggested yesterday was to have a series of ponds and maybe the newts will basic, uh, basically occupy the main pond 
and allow the satellite phones to, to thrive. Uh, but it, it is a common problem. I think a lot of people have that problem. Uh, we've tried planting things like this. Great, um, this is great woodrush, uh, Lusula sylvatica. So this is a native woodland plant. We used to have loads of dragonfly. And I say the pond is full of dragonfly nymphs, um, but they don't do so well. For the, the sedge aficionados, this is bladder sedge, Carex vesicaria, uh, these lovely arching fronds and pendulous food bodies. We've got false fox sedge, I think there's some old sedge over there as well. So uh, again, we, we try and just keep diversifying everything. This is a non native species. Um, Obviously, very, very fragrant. This is lavender, um, English lavender. And uh, once this comes into flower, again, it's really, really good for the, for the pollinators. The bees do love this a lot. Um, what else have we got over here, Sam? Oh, this is a bit of a, a localized thing. I think we introduced this to the garden about eight years ago. This is called Smith's Pepperwort, and it only grows at a couple of places on Gower at the moment that it, it, it does turn up periodically when ground's disturbed. So this is Smith's pepperwort and I say I planted a couple of these in the garden, collected some seed and grew it and we've now just got plants everywhere. In fact if you go on the crack in the pavement there Sam you can see a nice Smith's pepperwort growing there. And a lot of these species once you do introduce one or two plants into your garden they will proliferate themselves if you just let them get on with things. So just over here this is a, another wild clary plant, which is just self-seeded in the cracks in the pavement. You've got, uh, you've got some um, stalks bill here. This is actually musk stalks bill, which is one of the rarer ones. You've also got um, small scabious, which is self-seeded. If you just go over there, there's more of the, the wild clary, more Smith, Smith's pepperwort. So basically, the more, you, the more you sow and the more you introduce, and I don't get hung up if species fail. So if, if I plant something and it fails, I just think, well, something else will do better. So again, I would just say experiment and find out what works for you. So the marjoram is another species which has gone crazy. This is a, go a golden um, garden variety of marjoram. Uh, and the number of invertebrates that go on this later on in the year when it's flowering is spectacular, uh, including some of the little micro moths as well, the or pyrosta oratas. Uh, it's a beautiful little moth, uh, which is a day-flying job bee that you, you see always on the marjoram in summer. Okay, let's uh, move on up the garden a bit. So here's a, our lawn which is mowed. So I actually think mowed lawns are good for wildlife, despite all the things we're told about no more may. There are definitely benefits. I mean, this is, the, the blackbirds love this. Uh, the hedgehogs come out at night and they're always... Find, well, they, I guess they must find them there, it's very easy to catch on it. Um, so whenever we come out to look for hedgehogs, this is where we come. There's hedgehog poo there, so this says, yeah. Now this is another plant we introduced, and this is a biennial plant. Well, there's actually a bee on it, look. Uh, I don't think we can pick up on that. It's a, a tree bee, just uh, working its way around the flowers of this Vipus bugloss. Uh, so Vipus bugloss, as I say, it's a biennial species. Um, and if you do want to introduce to you, this to your garden, it's best you introduce it for two years on the trot. Otherwise, you'll have flowers one year, gap year, then flowers. You'll only have flowers every other year. So if you, if you introduce it for two years on the trot uh, and let it seed, it will, it will go all over the place. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and you can see the nice stand of it here. Uh, it really is a spectacular plant. There's another tree bee on it as well. So there you go. There's the tree bee on the... And there's another bee on it over there. That is a uh, early um, Bombus pratorum. It's called the early bumblebee. Common name. So yeah, Vipus bugloss is one of my favourites. It, it is a lovely plant. And growing next to it is another spectacularly good plant. Uh, this is called Teucrium comedrifolia. Um, I can't remember the, co the common name, sorry, but it's it's related to uh, wood uh, wood sage. Uh, it is actually a native to Britain but only at one place in Sussex, I think, or Surrey, uh, and it grows prostrately there. And is, so this is probably a, a garden variety of it, or maybe a, a European subspecies of it. But once that starts flowering, you see the buds coming, 
it again just pro produces a profusion of flowers adored by bees. Uh, and there's a there's a whole concoction of weedy things in here which do well, including we planted quite a lot of this this year. This is uh, the wild cabbage which you see on the cliffs. Uh, if you go to the Vale of Glamorgan, uh, you see some spectacular cabbage plants growing on the cliffs, um, and they are really good for wildlife in so many ways. Um, so we thought we'd try growing that in the garden and. Anyway, we sold a lot of seed and we've just got masses of them. So I'm uh, quite happy to give them to people if they want to come and collect some. Um, sorry, some ornamental bushes, um, which are okay. This is a really good plant, uh, non-native again. This is Arisimum bulls as mold. And this is, this, is a, this is one which is still a bit young. I'm just going to go down to the, the one over here. Excuse me, I'm going to quick pop down to our, our little patio and show you how big it gets. So this is, uh, this is how big a rissum and balls as mold gets. And again, it, it really is great for bees. We sort of sit on the patio and uh, watch the bees come around us when it isn't so cold. So that, that's, uh, that's a good one. Easy to propagate from cuttings. There's some nice sisters here, which got a beautiful fragrance. They always remind me of our trips to Portugal. We've got a couple of sisters growing here. I'm just going to mention our bird feeder because we do like our birds as well. Um, at the moment, we've got we don't we don't see many squirrels here, which I know not everyone likes squirrels, but we don't mind squirrels. We don't even mind the odd rat that comes up. But um, so yeah, we just feed it with a standard mix, and that seems to attract in a whole host of sparrows. We have masses and masses of house sparrows in Gusain, and it always makes me laugh when they say house sparrows in massive decline. But you can sort of in a in a in a few weeks' time, we can have as many as 60 in the garden. Really, uh, They really do go crazy here. A few shrubs. This thing has just finished flowering. I don't know the name of it. It's a clematis. But the fragrance from... Sorry? One of the Montana group, is it? But when this flowers, the scent from it is phenomenal. And, uh, yeah, so that is... That's got over. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I, I think I mentioned in our habitat list, we don't actually have any woodland anywhere near us. Uh, so Gus Island is pretty much devoid of woodland, uh, yet we get lots and lots of woodland species in the garden. And the reason being is that basically gardens are pseudo woodlands in many respects. So if I, if I just do that, you can sort of see we're at the end of a long line. You can see the neighbour's trees. There's a horse chestnut there, some Leilandii eyes. I can see some uh, sycamore, lots of garden privet, of course. And all these trees support a tremendous number of species of invertebrate which of course are food for birds etc they have lots of invertebrates uh, we sort of uh, feed on them in, in the, in the uh, on species like the oak produces a lot of pollen it's a very important food source for, for invertebrates um, <clears throat> so, so we've we've introduced a few shrubs this is one of the very very slow ones <laughs> this is a uh, this is wayfaring tree down here which has been taken over by the old uh, calastegia, the bindweed. Uh, so I'm hoping that will put on a bit more gro growth this year. We're found tree is reaches this western edge of its range in uh, in Mumbles. I planted this broom the other day, which is one we grew from seed. Um, there's a, a little oak tree there, which I'm trying to keep small. Now, when we moved here 20 years ago, we planted a tw so 24 years ago we. Not long after moving and we planted an oak tree from an acorn that Sandra was growing in school with the kids. She got more grey acorns. And the tree you can see at the top there, doesn't look very big in this actually because it's on wide angle, but that, that's a, a big oak. We'll, we'll get to that one later. <laughs> um, so we're still in the middle section of the garden. Uh, um, yeah, so this was one given to me by Ian Morgan. This was a uh, Coriolopsis. What's that? Hmm? Oh yeah, yeah. So we're going to move off plants for a second and talk about hedgehogs. I mentioned that the lawn is great for them. Now last last autumn we came out and we had six together, well, six in the garden at one time, and uh, they actually nest in their shed. So there's our little garden shed, which we inherited, covered with ivy, which is, again is great for invertebrates. Um, and they actually nest underneath a, a unit in there. Uh, I put a video camera on them and we see them coming in and out. Uh, but we were we were given one by the Gower Bird Hospital 
a few weeks ago, which, which I put in under here. So underneath this, uh, I, I'm guessing there's not going to be a hedgehog in it yet because we only put it in a couple of weeks ago, a week ago. It's one of these igloo hedgehog houses. And Simon from the bird hospital kindly told us what to do. He said, dig a, dig a basin of soil in the ground and put it in, stake it down, put some leaves on it. And he said, wait and see. I won't stick my hand in there just in case there is one in there. But I, I've tried to make the entrance a bit darker uh, just by putting that wreathing tile on, give it a bit more of a screen. And he said, don't bother lining it. He said, put some grass and stuff around it. Now, I piled loads of grass around here when I put it in, and it's all gone. So I'm guessing it's now in there. And there Maybe a hedgehog in there. But we, we, we had the camera trap out the other night, and there were hedgehogs doing the old mating sort of noises uh, and sort of following each other around the garden. So I'll put a bit of more, more moss there. See if, um, okay, so that's do cite a hedgehog um, house, by the way. It is best to put it somewhere very, very dark. And sheltered the last thing they want is to be warmed up in the sunshine and get over, overheated so put it somewhere nice and quiet nice and dark so they won't get disturbed so anyway we're, we're busy on the last leg of the journey now there's there's looking back towards the house on our middle bit of garden as i say we've got a 70 meter garden oh god i gotta mention this bush now this is this is probably my favorite bush in the garden this is um alder buckthorn and it it is the most attractive shrub for bees than anything we've ever planted. All these tiny little flowers you can see in here, just the bees do just go, I, I say you won't believe me because there are very few bees flying around today, but on a warm sunny day, it is just covered in bees. Tree bees go especially bonkers for it. Uh, so this is alder buckthorn and it's a native species. Um, and uh, I say it's, it's the best thing we have. We have brimstones as well coming and laying their eggs. So we found the caterpillars of the brimstone moth on here, uh, brimstone butterfly, I beg your pardon. Um, so if you do get a chance to, to buy a, an older buckthorn, I would heartily recommend planting one in your garden. It doesn't get too big uh, and it just produces masses and masses of flowers, which the bees love, and then also produces lots of berries, which the birds love. But we're going to try and collect some this year and get some of the berries at least before the, before the birds gobble them all up. So just chew down here, there's a bit more. Great in that weed coming about to come into flower. That's, there's a small scabious bush, uh, which is, which is, uh, I say they are like bushes in a garden situation rather than these scrawny little plants you see on the cliffs. So, um, this is, yeah, so anyway, we're in the land of the polytunnels now. We've got three of these cheap uh, polytunnels. You can buy them for about 150 quid, and they, you're supposed to take them down in the winter. Now, we live. 50 meters elevation, which doesn't seem very high, but it's the highest point we're signing. So if I if I point the camera in that direction, you can actually see the estuary from here. And you would if the light was better. And uh, see, oh, there we are. there's the Lucker estuary in the in the background there. So when the wind comes in off the sea, it really howls through our garden. And these polytunnels, I honestly thought they would just blow away in the gales we had last year, uh, Storm Dennis or whatever it was. Uh, but they, incredibly, they've all stayed upright. So I say for a £150 investment uh, per polytunnel, they've actually done incredibly well. Uh, I'll take you into one of them in a minute. But I'll just show you some of the plants we've been growing for our, our Celtic wildflowers business. Um, uh, right, so these are, these are still all plants which are still quite small. This is, um, this is actually, um, yeah, hoary rock rose. So this is grown from seed from uh, from Gower site. Uh, you've got this is a small uh, sorry sand catch fly. This is this hasn't come into flower yet, but I collected some seed from uh, a site in Carmarthenshire last year, and the sand catch fly is is looking great. So when that comes into flower, it's got beautiful small but beautiful flowers. This is common rock rose, which is again that's from. Uh, from seed sown last year, so that's actually establishing itself quite nicely. Maybe even get some flowers this year if we're lucky. Um, there's some more common rock rose there. Um, we've got some more tree mallows. So these these are grown in the tree mallows, uh, grown in plug trays. So these are you can see you've got nice roots coming on them. So these are these you get 77 plants per tray, and these trays are. Um, long life trays so they last about 20 years and they are recyclable at the end of the year at the end of their 20 years i should say and um 
and basically, yeah, once you once you finish, you, so you can recycle them. So we grow everything in peat-free compost, of course. Um, and these are fox gloves. So again, these 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 are like the vipers bugloss of biennials. So these will be plants for flowering next year. So we we might pot some of those on, um, and see see if we have any projects where they can be used. Um, we don't do an awful lot of composting. <laughs> I, I just stick it all on the, the open compost heap, which is good. But this one, yeah, it's full of full of life. It needs uh, it probably it's been there a long time now, isn't it? Teasel uh, is another thing we grow, and another thing which self seeds readily all around the garden. Again, these all these are all plants which are so easy to grow, and they're so good for wildlife in so many ways. You can see this one here; it's full of aphids, which from a if you're a a vegetable garden, you'd probably be horrified. But um, anyway, I'm just going to move on quickly. I'm going to head into the polytunnel and then we'll have a little look at the. So we've got some oxide daisies. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. So this is a this is what we call a, a wet bed. So we 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 did some trials growing sphagnum moss in this again in these plug trays we have. So um, it grows incredibly well. You don't need any substrate whatsoever. You just literally grow the moss in these trays. And these, these will, by the end of the summer, the moss will have basically uh, uh, doubled, well, grows sort of double and a bit more. Um, so it'll be probably be up here and spilling over the edges. And it's literally just growing in water. So there's no need for any substrate whatsoever. Uh, the, unfortunately, the blackbirds do tend to peck at it. But um, so this, this is why these are looking a bit sad for themselves. But these are actually, um, planted from remnants tin uh, I say it's a complicated story but basically yeah by the end of the summer even this horrible looking stuff will actually be looking really really good um, so uh, but they say if you want to create a, a really easy sort of wetland feature in your garden we actually use this for watering we just we just put plants in pots or trays we just drop them in here and you can water them that way without having to spray them but all this is is just a sheet of uh, damp proof membrane and a frame made out of roofing battens and you just put the, the damp proof membrane inside the roofing battens uh, fill it up with water and you've actually got a, a nice shallow pond and we've got frogs newts and everything coming in here little water beetles um, so you could actually create something very very cheaply I mean that probably cost me um, sort of less than a tenner to make and, and it's it's a nice sort of a pond you can, you can grow plants in you can have wildlife in and it's it's not a permanent feature. You don't even have to dig a hole. Um, so what Mark was saying, I mean, frogs basically like shallow, shallow pools that warm up quickly. So I mean, they've never bred in here. They always seem to breed in the pond where the newts are. Um, but yeah, we should really put some frog spawn in one of these. And the tadpoles will probably develop very very quickly in this sort of shallow warm water. We do have another one up here. So this is black hole hound. Another native species we introduced to the garden and it's gone bonkers on the compost heap oh yeah the other thing we do is put down oh you've, you've had a look at you we put down tiles we get a lot of slow worms in the garden but again it's probably not. yeah there's a mullet but there's probably not enough warmth today to tempt them out all oh, right yeah but yeah if you've got a bit of uh, old uh, tile or slate and you've got some felt it's worth putting them putting them around the garden and just seeing if it attracts any slow worms or other reptiles, amphibians. So it was quite interesting to discover what you didn't realise was in your garden until you start it's about like running a moth trap. You don't realise all the wildlife you have in your garden at night until you actually start surveying and sampling for it. There was another tree mallow here, which just seems to be getting a bit of height on it. Another one of our wet beds. Oh, this is another Neath Patalba plant. This is wild licorice. So this is all grown from seed. So you never know, these plants might flower this year. That's quite a nice, a nice one. Um, more plants, some black poplars from Carmarthenshire. Native black poplar, of course, is a very rare tree. And these are, again, these are all uh, the dyer's green weed from the seed that Charles and myself collected um, a couple of autumns ago. It's slow, very slow to germinate, but once it does come, it comes very well. Right, so well, this is this is where Sandra will sit and do some of her potting on. 
This is the compost we use. It's um, silver mixed peat free growing media. And it is, an, it's, if you want to grow stuff peat free, this is the stuff to get. But it, it is ludicrously expensive. If you try buying it in small amounts online, you sort of, you, you spend a fortune. Uh, it's like 27 quid a bag or something. But if you buy it by the bulk load, you do get a lot cheaper than that. Right, hedgehog feeding station. This is one Sandra put together for our hedgehogs and they come every night and feed in here. I don't know if you want to take it apart, Sand, just to show people how, it's, how easy it is to make a hedgehog house. It's basically two bricks. Um, let's see, a nice uh, yeah, pot marion dish is essential. <laughs> uh, yeah, just a little back to stop uh, any cats sneaking in from the back. Um, yeah, a little, obviously, some stop the rain getting in, and then uh, it's really just any anything where it it'll restrict cats cats getting in. So it's useful just to sort of squeeze that up a little bit to make it a bit too awkward for the cats to get in. But say so we put the the camera on this, and we have foxes coming in occasionally. I normally sprinkle a bit of food in front as well when we set the camera. Uh, there's a couple of local cats call in as well as our cat. Um, but we always have lots and lots of hedgehog activity. So this is the tree we planted as, as an acorn. Um, it's now probably somewhere between 30 and 40 centimetres uh, diameter. And we were given a nest box by a friend, which has got blue tits in it, um, last couple of years. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, Sandra's saying, point out the, um, that we leave a gap for the hedgehogs, obviously, to come in and out of the gardens. It's very important that if you are going to encourage hedgehogs in your garden, that you make sure that they've got good, easy access in and out. So anyway, that's our, that's our oak tree. As you see, it's, it's quite impressive now, and that, we planted that when we moved in the house. So again, I'll just uh, show you how big it is. It is a big old tree now. Um, so anyway, just well, let's pop into the polytunnel now. And uh, oh, this is another plant. I planted this plant. This is Dame's Violet. And I planted this specifically to attract a moth I, that we've never had in the garden. A little micro moth called Plutella poractella. Uh, I'm still waiting to record that species, but uh, now we've got the Dame's Violet established. I'm hoping it will turn up. So anyway, welcome into polytunnel number one. This, these are all um, purging buckthorn seedlings. Uh, which have been pricked out from these trees. So they've all got to come out and be pricked out as well. Um, but yeah, it's it basically we bought some roofing battens, made some staging. So the whole thing with the polytunnel and the staging probably came to about 300 quid. But honestly, the speed at which plants come on in here is phenomenal. These are all, in this tree here, This we, got, we did get some work from... Uh, Butterfly Conservation in England to grow violets for a fertility project. And uh, obviously sourcing violets, it's really quite hard. But we're lucky in that we've got lots of violets as weeds in our garden. And one of the beds I turned over in the winter just had a profusion, profusion of seedlings. So we pricked them all out and we put them up and the speed at which they've grown is, is quite phenomenal. So uh, it's just, I, I just love growing stuff from seed these days. These are all, this is another uh, Neef Patalbert thing. This is yellow horn poppy seedlings. They're coming on a, a treat. So these are from um, the, 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 um, the, the new university, the Bay Campus site. There's a lovely population of yellow horn poppy there, which produces millions and millions of seed. Um, yeah, so seed collecting is, season is just about to start upon us. These are seeds I collected uh, the other day. This is witch elm. So, um, yeah, so we're hoping to grow lots of witch elm trees. Um, and yeah, well, there's more kidney vet. We've got more kidney vets than you could you want to, <laughs> care to believe. So most of our plants, as I say, we're, we've got a nursery up at least Ninny, and that's where we take all of our plants. But it's very convenient having the polytunnels at home. So we can just literally step out in the garden and, and do some work in the garden, uh, getting stuff ready. And once we, got them, once we get them to, sort of to that stage, that's when we that's when we take them up to uh, take them up to the nursery, pop them up in the nursery. So I think that's probably uh, as as much as uh, you probably care to see in the garden without getting too too uh, 
too concerned. I know we do have a, we do have a standing out area over here for more plants. So we do have this again. This is our pre pre standing out area before stuff goes out up to Fleece Ninny. Uh, so we've got some thrift here, lots of ericaceous things. So we've got lots of um, cross leaf teeth and little baby heathers coming on. Really, all sorts of stuff to be honest. Um, it's quite mind boggling at times. These are the uh, Erisimum bulls as morphs I was telling you about. So these we took these as cuttings last year, and they're already flowering. Um, so so yeah, these are these are very nice. Anyway, I think I think that's probably enough from me now. I don't know whether there's time for any questions or not, or whether I've gone on too long. I have no idea what the time is. <laughs> You've hit half three exactly, Barry. If you're happy to stay on, then we can host for questions. It's up to you. If yeah. You're no, no problem at all. Yeah, okay, I thought I thought I'd been getting close. <laughs> no, exactly, dead on. I'm very impressed. Okay, everyone, if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Otherwise, if you pop them in the chat box, I'll read them out. And we also have a quick poll that will go on in the background as well. Um, and I also just wanted to say thank you to Barry. And I'm trying to say, I'm not sounding completely jealous of your absolutely stunning garden. It's gorgeous. Uh, well, it's it's, 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 it's honest, it is, it is a bit messy in places, but uh, I don't, that's all part of gardening for wildlife, really. Absolutely. So. No, no one wants me. Wildlife. <laughs> all right. Um, I have a question from Iona. Where do you recommend buying plants from? Um, well, as I say, we, I, I mean, I didn't do today as a, as a promotion for ourselves, but we, we did set up a business called Celtic Wildflowers, which specializes in growing wildflowers which are all of local provenance. So I've, I've pressed something and uh, there we are, back in the room. <laughs> um, so yeah, we obviously sell plants, but we, we generally sell for projects. Would you mind holding this on? I'm, I, we, we, we sell plants for projects primarily, but we, we, we do sell to the public as well and, and wildlife gardeners. So if, if she wants to go onto the Celtic Wildflowers website, or, uh, Sandra says Facebook is better to contact, contact us through. And we can we can sort of tell you what thing, what sort of suitable plants we might have. But to be honest, there there are plenty of other places. If you want seeds, we don't do seeds, so you'd have to go somewhere like Emma's Gate. Uh, if you just want ordinary garden plants, there's um, I mean, this all the nurseries will will sell plants which are suitable for bees. There's so many things you can plant. Um, but yeah, if you want to come and and uh, contact us on Facebook, we can certainly make some recommendations. Thank you. If you struggle to find uh, Barry on Facebook, he was co-host for the event today and that is linked to Celtic Wildflowers as well, so you can find him through that. Uh, we have a message from Charles, it's not a question, it's inspirational. Thank you Barry and Sandra. <laughs> Thank you Charles. Yeah, always glad to hear from you and, uh, and I know that you have a very philosoph similar philosophy to me, so... Uh, Good, good that you tuned in to see the garden because I know you can't at this time of year. But uh, thank you. Do we have any other questions, folks? Probably heard enough from me now. Absolutely. <laughs> Want to know when you're selling your house so I can buy it just for the garden? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been here 24 years now, so uh, yeah, yeah, you can. <laughs> I said the thing is with the garden, you, what we've done. You can do anywhere. It's it's nothing uh, special. I, w I mean, I always say we have a very ordinary garden, and even the stuff we've done with the garden, it's 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 really just been about diversifying it as much as we can, rather than um, rather than trying to do anything special from a um, a prettiness point of view. But uh, yeah, we do we do like it. Um, I have a message from Tara. She says, "Very beautiful. Can we have some stills photos, please, of your garden?" Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, we'll do that. No problem. Yeah, we can we can do that. Uh, it's, oh, she's just added to it. Sorry, to show and demonstrate to less wildlifey people how nice a wildlife friendly garden can look. Yeah, I mean, I said it, yeah, it doesn't all have to be wild and rugged. I said, in fact, a well maintained lawn is actually very very good for so many species. Even things like starlings, they they love digging out um, um, the tipulid larvae, you know, the crane fly larvae. And if you've got a nicely well maintained lawn they'll happily uh, help eradicate your crane flies larvae from your garden. So uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely an asset. Yeah, thank you. 
Oh, we got a couple more. Uh, uh, some dodgy guy called Vaughan has said, thanks, Barry and Sandra. Very inspirational. Um, <laughs> and Becky has asked, how do I get Vipers bug gloss to grow in a garden that has damp or clay soil? Um, yeah, good question. Um, obviously, you can go to a lot of effort and have a raised beds, or uh, we, we grow them in pots. They can, they can actually reach gigantic proportions growing in a... Do you know the, the kidney vetch I, I showed you on the windowsill, the, the, the front windowsill? If you get one of these sort of one foot window boxes and you grow a vipers bugloss in there, it will, it will grow as big as the ones that grow in the soil. And because they, because they like to grow in sort of drought prone soils, you don't have to really spend much time tending them either. So, um, so yeah, I would, I would definitely say uh, plant pots and window boxes, and you can improvise with anything, to be honest, even if uh, from like anything from an old tire, you fill the middle of an old tire with soil, um, the roots will get in and you'll actually uh, create a nice elevated bit of well-drained soil, which a lot of these plants will thrive in. And you're recycling at the same time. Excellent. Oh, they're flying in now. Uh, next question. <laughs> Thanks, Barry and Sandra. What's the most foolproof, wildlife-friendly plants to start with for a beginner gardener? Oh my God, there's absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Sandra's saying scabious, but there is a proviso with scabious and that it does like a well-drained soil. Um, so, um, so yeah, if you, if you want to try scabious, uh, it is incredibly tough. And as you've seen in our garden, it was growing cracks in pavements. Um, if you've got, if you've got sort of, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just looking around me now with the foxgloves over there, it's fantastically easy. Foxgloves, as I say, the biennials, it's the same with the vibus bugloss. So if you're going to grow biennial plants, you need to create a little bit of disturbance to, to get them to germinate. But a lot of what we grow are perennials, so once you've introduced them, they should persist and grow bigger and bigger year on year. So as I say, scabious is a perennial species which once it's established, will just keep on getting sort of bigger and better. Uh, and you've got three species of scabious. Uh, I mean, I, what I would do, devil's bit scabious is spectacularly robust. Um, it, will, it will literally, it's, in, it's virtually impossible to kill devil's bit scabious. Um, and it will grow in dry soils, wet soils. Uh, but the only problem with devil's bit scabious is the flowers come late on in the year. So they only start getting underway in August. So if you've got devil's bit scabious and small scabious or field scabious, field scabious obviously grows this kind of height and it just keeps on producing loads and loads of flowers. So, so yeah, I would say scabiouses and foxgloves. But to be honest, there's so much choice, you can't really, uh, but those are, those are pretty foolproof anyway, in answer to the question. I was beginning to sound like Boris Johnson there, not, not actually answering the question. <laughs> You gave us a few options, thank you. Uh, the person who asked says thank you as well. I think it was you. <laughs> You're Next welcome. Question. How do I get orchids to grow in my lawn or do I just have to hope that they appear on their own? Um, right, no, there's an, there's an easy answer to this. If, after the orch if you go walk, walk in the countryside and go for a walk and you come across southern marsh orchids or common spotted orchids, if your soil is damp, I would say get some southern marsh orchid seeds. Uh, if it's drier, look for common spotted orchid seeds. Now you only need one seed pod, because within one seed pod there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of seeds. If you just wait for that seed pod, uh, just pick a seed pod off a, off a plant just before it, it's, um, it, it splits. So as it goes from sort of green to brownish, before it splits, uh, and literally just sort of scatter it on the soil, your soil may not be suitable. It, it does depend a lot on your soil, whether you've got the, the right mi sort of, uh, microorganisms living in the soil. So it may not work. Uh, we're lucky here in that our soils are very, very impoverished uh, and they're probably quite diverse in terms of their microbiology. Um, so if you do, if you're lucky enough to have an old lawn, which has got like very, uh, well, very well established sward in it, you're far more likely to be successful than if you've got a new lawn. But there's no harm in trying, and you, I say it's what I'm saying to do isn't very isn't destructive. In fact, it, it's going to enhance uh, the wildlife in a, in a county context. So uh, yeah, collecting the odd uh, seed pod off an orchid flower, I say it's not very harmful, and uh, and if you do manage to get them established in your lawn, then obviously uh, everyone's a, everyone's a winner then, the wildlife included. 
but yeah, if you try to do it the technical way, it's all very high tech, and uh, you need to use all these aseptic techniques, which we, we don't we don't attempt those. They're, they're more for the specialist orchid growers. Okay, thank you very much. I got one more here. Hi, Bo. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Very jealous of your garden. I took some cuttings <laughs> row in this past winter and had around a 50% success rate. Do you have any tips? For, for what, sorry? For Rowan. Oh, Rowan. Uh, it, well, to be honest, we've, we only started growing trees this winter and we're still, although we've got a lot of trees, we've actually got over 10,000 trees established this year up at the nursery, uh, but we've not managed to collect, we missed the window of opportunity for Rowan berries this year. We only decided to collect them in November and by the time we went out to collect the seeds, all the birds had eaten them. So we weren't, we weren't able to experiment. But yeah, it's all to do with stratification. So you need to, there's, it's all online basically. If you just Google how to stratify rowan berries, there'll be a tutorial on how to do it. And that's what we've been doing. We're, we're not horticulturalists. Uh, I'm an ecologist. Sandra's a, a teacher. And, and we've basically, I, I, I sort of use my ecological knowledge, but anything horticultural I just google it um, so you don't have to be a, a sort of a, an experienced horticulturalist to have good success you just need to know how to google so uh, google away is what I say <laughs> other services are available obviously <laughs> yeah. That's exactly yeah yeah but yeah you, you need to stratify the seeds I put them in the fridge for a while usually for about 12 weeks excellent thank you um, I think that's it on the questions um, so if anyone wants to unmute to say thank you to Barry, I think we'll call it <laughs> there. But if anyone comes up with any other questions, feel free to post them on our social media and we'll try and get them answered for you. But yeah, thank you very much both Barry and Sandra for a really incredible look around your gorgeous garden. <laughs>